I have one relevant disclosure, which is the implant we're talking about. I, I do get paid consulting from Wright Medical. So let's start with a case. So this is a 71 year old uh, lady we treated about a year ago. Um, she works part time and she's active. And this is a common feature of our older population is that they actually remain very active uh, and do manual hobbies like gardening. You can see she's got a, quite a distal comminuted coronal shear type fracture of the um, distal humerus. And our traditional options um, for surgical treatment, bearing in mind non-operative is probably not appropriate in this case, would be a fixation, total elbow, and now we're going to talk about hemiarthroplasty. And there's no doubt that total elbow, uh, sorry, fixation is the gold standard and remains the gold standard if possible. But if we go back and look at our case, you can see that this is an extremely distal fracture. There are multiple shallow and parotic fragments. And I think it's, it would be fair to say it would be difficult to achieve a reliable, stable fixation in, in this setting. And we do see failures of uh, fixation, often because of technical errors, but there are a number of patients who come back with um, problems related to fixation. And these are all cases that we've uh, been referred or, or treated. So going back to our case, if we look at, um, if we think that we're considering an arthroplasty, then, well, total elbow is definitely the, um, the, the gold standard arthroplasty, I would say. But hemiarthroplasty is the new kid on the block and has some particularly interesting features. And the reason for, to for total elbow being the established uh, option is that it has a, a degree of evidence base behind it. And this uh, study by McKee and the Canadian group um, mm -hmm. is often cited where they did uh, a randomized trial of fixation versus total elbow replacement in uh, around 25 patients in each group. And they had superior functional scores at every time point, but up to two year follow up. But it is worth noting they also had two revisions from of the to in the total elbow group. So uh, revision arthroplasty, which Mark's going to talk about later, is 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 not something we want by design. If we look closer at the other studies with published data on total elbow replacement for trauma, what we notice is that the the sh the short term term studies up here. Uh, have good outcomes. But as we get into the longer term studies, you start seeing a higher revision rate. And these revision, these complications that develop uh, are difficult to, to resolve without a complete revision of the prosthesis. And they frequently uh, are due to polyethylene wear or ulnar component complications. So here's a case of something we really want to do our best to avoid, a 66-year-old treated for with a total elbow primarily for fracture and an 18-month follow-up. He's got catastrophic failure of his um, humeral component with bone loss, and uh, he's never going to have an, a, a normally functioning arm again. And we want to avoid this sort of problem. So what's the role of hemiarthroplasty? Well, it, it may um, offer the advantages of a, an arthroplasty over fixation, but without the ulnar uh, or bearing related complications of a total elbow. And because of that, it may be suited better to trauma than total elbow in those patients who want to maintain activity. But it raises questions. So what are the best indications for hemiarthroplasty? And will the outcomes match total elbow and fixation? Is hemiarthroplasty going to be reproducible? And what are the technical points? And how long is it going to last? And have we just opened a Pandora's box of complications related to native joint wear and instability? Because remember, this is effectively an unlinked arthroplasty. And as shoulder and elbow surgeons, we have this fear of hemiarthroplasty. This is a case referred to us and a typical picture of uh, a problematic hemiarthroplasty. And this is certainly, if I had to do this, be one of the, the uh, most miserable most sort of dreaded operations I undertake is a shoulder hemiarthroplasty because I really don't know what the outcome for the patient is going to be. But we have to remember that the shoulder is a different joint. There's a, there's a natural sliding of the humeral head in normal motion relative to the glenoid and edge loading of the glenoid. So when you have a cuff deficient shoulder, it's extremely difficult to control um, glenoid wear, and which is why we get problems. 
And interestingly, uh, in relation to hemiarthroplasty in the hip, there's this um, large study that's just come out, a randomized trial for patients over 50 showing equivalent outcomes with hemiarthroplasty and fewer complications. And what I found interesting about this paper, if you see that one of the uh, uh, key authors is Amar Rangan, one of our um, shoulder, uh, our, the president of the British Shoulder and Elbow Society. So, so I don't think elbow hemiarthroplasty is necessarily synonymous with other joints. And it actually has a long uh, track record and predates total elbow replacement back to the uh, 50s, where it was tried and then total elbow replacement and took over and there were several generations of implants that went from uh, uh, sort of completely um, non-anatomic devices to now what we have which is termed an unlinked anatomic and convertible device which is the latitude so it's anatomic in, in uh, apostrophes because it's not truly anatomic but you'll note the spool is uh, as on anatomic as as possible compared to on the right side the total elbow and and key feature is that it's convertible to a total elbow without removing the stem. And this, um, this screw in the middle here is important because it's cannulated and allows fixation of the ligaments through the implant to, to offer stability, which is a unique feature. So what are the type of fractures we might treat? Well, um, comminuted distal humeral fractures with multiple articular fragments, but in particular the middle one here, these complex coronal shear fractures with virtually no, um, uh, with very poor bone stock and these distal um, fractures that are hard to stabilize. And, and on top of this, for all of them, it's the poor bone quality where we'd be going towards an arthroplasty. Obviously, if the fracture is reconstructable, we shouldn't be considering a hemiarthroplasty or, or a total elbow, and we should do everything to um, reconstruct the fracture. Uh, if there's pre-existing arthritis, then a, then a total elbow is going to be better than a hemiarthroplasty. And if there's an associated coronoid fracture on the CT scan, then um, I've seen in my own practice that actually intraoperatively a hemiarthroplasty will be unstable. So we then convert that to a total elbow intraoperatively, which is easy to do. So what are the gray areas? So if there's a radial head fracture and an olecranon fracture, hemiarthroplasty is still possible. In fact, hemiarthroplasty was originally described through an olecranon osteotomy. I'd uh, recommend exercising caution for revision of failed fixation. So in this case, you can see that hem a hemiarthroplasty was done, but the elbow remained unstable. And that's because the soft tissues have been attenuated, damaged or contracted and aren't reliable enough to stabilize an unlinked articulation. And then open fractures is a possibility where there's severe bone loss. And here's a case where we've done a handful of open fractures with hemiarthroplasty, a grade 3A open fracture with, you can see that the capitellum has been extruded through the wound, there's bone loss left on the road, but it's a, a, a clean but contaminated open fracture. And hence here she had a, an excellent result at two years with a hemiarthroplasty, which you can consider to be the ultimate debridement for an open fracture. So this is the approach we use, which has been shown and described, but is worth showing again, is the para, lateral paralecranon approach. And, and as, as was mentioned earlier, I would use this approach for most distal humeral fractures because we can do fixation, we can perform a hemiarthroplasty, or we can perform a total elbow uh, through the same approach. And you can see that as we um, release the capsule, we split anconius, we split triceps, but triceps is left attached uh, on the olecranon. We can then deliver the distal humerus through this window and behind it you can see the radial head and it's very easy to instrument the distal humerus and then place it back into joint. So a key component of hemiarthroplasty is to stabilize the joint and uh, we have to fix the collateral ligaments, the epicondyles and the common and then uh, flexor and extensor origins back. And we do this by fixing um, the, uh, the ligaments through the implant. So they've been pre-placed and you can see us passing the um, ligaments from one side through the implant to the other side. And then um, uh, 
pre-placing all these sutures. So once they've been passed through the implant, then we um, we also want to suture the ligaments and the epicondyles uh, around the implant. So here you can see we're placing sutures around the medial epicondyle and the medial condyle, and then shuttling sutures around the implant. So we have this sort of three levels of uh, fixation through the implant, around the implant, and to the host, bo uh, host bone in the column. And then finally tying these, and you'll know that I've actually got a pointed reduction clamp, so we reduce the columns and the epicondyles uh, with compression and tie all the sutures at the end so that we maintain compression, maintain position. And then going back to our case that we showed at one year uh, post-op outcome, she's got an excellent score no pain and excellent range of motion. So what's the other evidence there for hemiarthroplasty? Well, we performed a systematic review some years back now, so there's more cases, but at that time there were only 121 published cases. But what we saw from that, that it was that there was a low revision rate and that reoperations re in the hemiarthroplasties were generally uh, due to, to problems associated with olecranon osteotomy. So we've gone well away from that sort of approach. And then Jeff Hughes has published um, this series, which is quite interesting, indicating that um, he's had six cases where they've done hemiarthroplasty in patients under the age of 55, uh, some as young as 30, and they've returned to sports like rock climbing without adverse outcome at a two-year follow-up. But in, I mean, although hemiarthroplasty is sometimes considered for younger patients, my, my personal feeling is the best results we see with hemiarthroplasty are in older patients. And for me, it's an operation that you would choose for a patient you'd consider a total elbow in for trauma. And then um, large series, independent series here as well, showing good uh, results. So the literature generally tells us that the, um, the revision rate is low, function is good, but there are relatively few numbers in the literature and the follow-up is short term. The evidence is low quality, mainly case series, and it tends to be published by expert surgeons. So is this procedure transferable to other surgeons um, with less experience or familiarity? This is our own experience to date. We've done 21 patients for acute trauma with um, six to 42 month follow-up. We haven't lost uh, any patients and you can see they've all had excellent Oxford scores. We've had very few complications, some related to the ulna nerve, but certainly no instabilities and no revisions. And recent unpublished work that we've, we're looking at is um, HEMI versus uh, fixation in over 65 year olds in our, in our institution. And we've found tentatively so far that complications, reoperations and range of motion are all better in the hemiarthroplasty group. Uh, although their scores were similar uh, in, in magnitude. So in conclusion, hemiarthroplasty, it definitely shows promise. It's not a shoulder hemiarthroplasty. Um, the results are, are certainly better, but we need to, um, we need long-term results. Also where we need a comparative studies and we need collection in registries to uh, ensure that this is a safe, long-standing procedure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.